Good evening. It is my distinct honor to welcome you to this timely forum on news media with television news anchor Greta Van Susteren, Newsweek Deputy Opinion Editor Batya Unger Sargon, and George Mason University Economics Professor Tim Gloskos. I'm especially delighted to welcome back University of Wisconsin alumna Greta Van Susteren to her native roots of Wisconsin. It's heartening to know that we have a national television news anchor who actually knows the proper pronunciation of Waukesha and Oconomowoc. <laughs> My name is Simon Bronner. I once corrected Neil Cavuto uh, about an Oconomowoc. I want you to that's fine. Well, later on, I'll ask you about the controversy over the pronunciation of Racine. <laughs> My name is Simon Bronner, and I'm the Dean of the College of General Studies at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee with robust community-facing campuses in Waukesha and Washington County. This presentation is in line with the college's outreach mission of civic engagement with our communities on issues of public concern and providing ample opportunities both inside and outside the classroom for learning and participatory experiences toward building a civil society. We've been happy to work with the Tommy G. Thompson Center on Public Leadership and particularly Associate Director Ruth Brash to bring this event to you. I wanna be sure to recognize leaders from the college who brought it to fruition. Kristen Feckety is Assistant Dean for Finance and Administration Kristen. Dr. Ron Galata is our campus administrator, as well as outstanding professor of sociology at our campus here in Waukesha. <laughs> and Kelly Gallagher, a former newspaper editor herself, is an administrative assistant in the dean's office. There's Kristen, wave hello. <laughs> Tonight's presentation has attracted great interest in both our institution and outside of it, and it will be live streamed. Let me share a couple of housekeeping notes. Please take a moment to silence or turn off your cell phones and refrain from photographing or recording the event. After the remarks, there will be time for questions from you, and ushers will have microphones so you can be heard. They are the ones wearing our yellow uh, shirts, oh, white shirts. <laughs> Over here, the ones on top are our ushers, yes, on either side. Now it is my pleasure to introduce your moderator tonight, Dr. Alexander Tak, who will introduce our speakers and the theme for tonight's stimulating discussion. Dr. Tak is director of the Thompson Center on Public Leadership and Associate Professor of Political Science at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. He also serves as faculty affiliate with the University of Wisconsin Law School and an honorary fellow in its Institute for Legal Studies. Dr. Tak received his PhD in Political Science from Stanford University, where he also received a master's degree in statistics. He and Dr. Gloss Close will have a lot to talk about <laughs> in numbers. His publications include essays in New Media and Society, Public Opinion Quarterly, and Political Analysis on the News Media, Presidential Elections, and the United States Supreme Court. Please give a hearty welcome to Dr. Tuck. Thank you, Dean Bronner. So good evening, I am Alex Tuck. I'm the director of the Tommy G. Thompson Center on Public Leadership. And we're really delighted to be able to work with UWM Waukesha to bring you tonight's event. Uh, thank you all for coming. Thank you to uh, tonight's speakers. And uh, thank you to Dean Bronner and everybody here uh, who helped make this possible, as well as uh, to Ruth and Mary Kate at the Thompson Center uh, for all your work on tonight's events. For those unfamiliar with the Thompson Center, let me just say a few brief words. The Thompson Center was established to follow in the footsteps of Governor Tommy Thompson, 
who proudly worked with colleagues on both sides of the aisle to advance the public good. The Thompson Center seeks to carry on Governor Thompson's legacy by informing and inspiring current and future public leaders, fostering leadership skills, and promoting effective public policy. We work to further these goals by hosting events, funding scholarships and research, and conducting other activities across the UW system. So Americans are overwhel uh, overwhelmingly believe the news media is important. For example, a recent Gallup Knight Foundation survey found that 81% said that it was critical or very important for democracy. Yet trust in the media has been steadily declining and concerns over political bias have been growing. That same Gallup survey showed 55% see a great deal of political bias in news coverage and only 9% see too much bias or none at all. So is there a problem? And if so, why and what can be done about it? We're fortunate to have three amazing people here to discuss this topic with us, each who brings a different perspective and expertise to the topic. Tim Grossclose is a professor of economics at George Mason University and holds the Adam Smith Chair at the Mercatus Center, completed his undergraduate education in mathematical and computational sciences from Stanford University, and his doctorate from the political economic uh, economics program at the Stanford Graduate School of Business. He's published two books and more than two dozen scholarly articles. And his research includes groundbreaking work on media bias, a topic which is the focus of his book, Left Turn, How, How Liberal Media Bias Distorts the American Mind. Batya Ungar Sargon is the deputy opinion editor of Newsweek. She completed her doctoral work at the University of California, Berkeley, she has written for numerous publications, including the New York Times, the Washington Post, Foreign Policy, Newsweek, and the New York Review of Books, and frequently appears on media outlets, including MSNBC, NBC, The Brian Lehrer Show, and NPR. She is the author of the best-selling book, Bad News, How Woke Media is Undermining Democracy, a paperback edition of which was just released last month. And finally, Greta Van Susteren, as you just heard, is a native Wisconsinite, as well as a political commentator and lawyer who currently hosts the record with Greta Van Susteren on Newsmax. She was born and raised in Appleton, Wisconsin, and completed her undergraduate education at the University of Wisconsin-Madison before earning two law degrees, a JD and an LLM, at Georgetown. She began her media career as a legal analyst at CNN, before moving to the Fox News Channel, where she anchored on the record for 14 and a half years, during which the show remained the highest rated cable news program in its prime time slot. She's also the author of two books, and her show, The Record with Greta Van Susteren, airs daily on Newsmax at 5 p.m. Central. So please join me in welcoming all three of our speakers tonight. work? Oh, good. Hi. So I'm a walker, so I'll start walking. Um, first of all, every time I hear when someone lists every place I work, the first thing I think, she can't hold a job. Um, and I don't know about you, but there's so many networks I've worked at. Um, it's a pleasure to be back here. I, I love Wisconsin. Shareholder, of course, it's immoral not to be. Um, I don't know if you two know what that is, but shareholder for the Green Bay Packers. Um, it's fun tonight, uh, just a little backside, a little backside. Um, one of the boys I went to uh, grade school and high school with came and showed up tonight. He's now 69, uh, but he, I, I think it was a boy. Um, but it's a particular pleasure to be here at Governor Tommy Thompson. Anybody who's ever lived in this state knows who Tommy Thompson is. And everyone talks about his accomplishments, but the thing I always point to, and this is what's so important when you talk about media bias or anything, Tommy Thompson accomplished so much. Even his welfare reform that eventually went national, he did it as a Republican with a Democratic Assembly and state. I mean, that's unheard of that anyone could have been as effective as a governor, when he had an opposing party that was in, in the House. So, you know, Tommy, I, I've you know, interviewed him a number of times when he was in Washington, uh, when he was a secretary for uh, Bush 43, and uh, he certainly is someone who, who not only should the state be proud of, but should be an example to all of us, because Tommy, um, he listened to other people. 
he thought, he worked hard, and uh, he's done a great job. So it's a particular pleasure to be here. Now, um, so let's talk about media bias. First of all, um, you know, a little bit about me. I'm curious here. Uh, raise your hand, anyone who's unfair in this room. Well, we got one person who's unfair. If I ask that question of all my friends at CNN, MSNBC, Fox, or Newsmax, any place, guess what? Not a single one of them there is unfair either. Nobody thinks he's unfair. It just, no one does. Um, so, but you look at all the numbers, listen to the statistics, and we're gonna see stuff. Uh, apparently the American people are not so convinced that we in the media are unfair. But I will say this is that uh, we, we are certainly flawed and, uh, and there's lots to be done. We're gonna have a bit robust discussion about it tonight. But, we start, but I start from the premise is that part of the problem is that none of us thinks we're unfair. That's a bit of a problem. We think we're doing a good job. Uh, obviously, we're not because we are, you know, we're in part uh, fueling some of the discord in this country, some of the desire. It's even, it's even come to the point now where the rivalry between networks, which used to be sort of a chase for the news and chase for the facts, is like the Packers versus the Bears. You know, you're one team or the other. I had a show called On the Record, the record, and, I've, and the rec I've had three shows with the name record, I can't remember the three. Um, all three shows, I would dare say, if you, if you followed my career, um, from Fox, MSNBC, or Newsmax, where I've had those shows, I bet you would say they are identical, or, or you know, they're the same show. Um, many times I've brought staff over from the other network, Yet people will say when I'm at Fox News, those who don't like me say that I'm a communist. And those who, when I was at MSNBC and they didn't like me, they say I was some right wing nut. Um, and yet it was a similarly the same show because what has happened in this business is that it clearly has, you know, their, their divided lines. Some of it quite justified, but you can see sort of this orientation of what has gone on in the news business, this evolution. And it's not been particularly fruitful, it's not good for democracy, it's not good for the news business, and it certainly isn't good uh, for the American people. So let's take, let's step, step back and look a little bit at the business. Um, when I grew up, it was, three people in New York, ABC, CBS, NBC, who decided what the rest of the country is going to hear in news. 22 minutes, seven, 22, half hours, 22 minutes of news because you have to sell ads. And um, they decided, they decided what we in Appleton, Wisconsin, was what's going to be important for us. You know, they decided. Um, it, wasn't, it wasn't our colleagues here in the state. So as, as the time moved on, though, Ted Turner came up with this crazy idea. Let's do 24-7 uh, cable, it was, which was, it was nuts. And in the beginning, when he, when he launched CNN about 1980, uh, it, it, they used to make fun of CNN at the White House and among other, it was not Cable News Network, it was Chicken Noodle Network. It was made fun of because nobody in his wild dream thought that anyone would have any interest whatsoever, whatsoever. Um, in 24/7 news, but well, for Ted was quite a visionary because it's been it's become quite a you know quite a business, uh, and it marched on. And CNN struggled, and it wasn't until the Gulf War um, in the late 80s that suddenly CNN became you know burst out on the right. We had uh, two of my colleagues at CNN were in Baghdad when the bombing started uh, in the first Gulf War, so CNN was finally put on the map. Then about uh, 19, July of 1996, uh, CNN was first getting some competition. MSNBC came, uh, came on the horizon. Uh, part of a partnership with Microsoft and part of NBC. And remember, all of us at CNN, we stood around TV as we watched the big launch. We got to see their set. And so we all watched and were set. And, M and MSNBC was born. And then three months later in October, uh, which we didn't pay any attention to it at CNN, I was there, uh, suddenly Fox News launched. And the race was on. Now we had all these cable news networks. And of course, since then, we've had so many different news outlets come along. But, but the line was drawn. And over time, it went from a good, healthy, you know, let's get to the news, let's get our cameras out there and show the American people. It got, it got a little bit competitive. And part of the problem is that each news organization is really divided, or at least it used to be, into the news gathering division and the opinion. And that, that line has been so blurred and that, I think that's a problem. Because first of all, opinion is so important. It's so important. We need a robust debate in this country and we need to talk to each other. But on the same token, the news gathering needs to be fact-driven. You know, we, we got, you know, you can't just make up facts. It's gotta be fact-driven. Um, and, and so what's happened though is that at least in, in the electronic news business, a lot of this has gotten blurred, which is then, which has obviously created problems. Because you can't tell whether you're listening to opinion or whether you're listening to fact. At best, 
and the news business is that it continues to supposed to be at night, and, the, and, the, and during the course of the day is the fact, but it's gotten so blurred. Um, then you pour into is that there's so many other f forces in this country, and we've basically at each other's throats. You know, we're, so that doesn't help particularly. And, and everybody knows, you know, what will spike ratings and what won't spike ratings. But we, in, in, in many ways, and, and look, I love my business. I love my colleagues at every, na at every network. They're all really good people. They all think they're fair like you. They all think they're fair, which, you know, you know I don't know, I know some of you think that CNN's fair, some think Fox is fair, some think Newsmax is fair. Everybody, everybody thinks it's fair. Um, but one of the problems that we have is that I think sometimes we've lost track of one thing, and that's this. I, my first occupation, uh, was a, besides running, out running the nuns at Xavier and Appleton, uh, was, uh, was as a lawyer. And in the Constitution, there's only one occupation, only one, that's protected by the Constitution expressly, has a special privilege, and that's freedom of the press. And I think in some ways, some of these news organizations have lost sight of the fact that, of the awesome responsibility. News organizations need to make money, but I always think that you don't have to make every dollar. It'd be okay to make 99 cents and not throw yourself under the bus, throw your stock and trade under the bus, or in some way, you know, it, you know spike the ratings and do things that might not otherwise be responsible. Um, but, but what's happened instead is it's become such a business, and it is a business and, and good for us. I don't like state-run TV. I don't like RT, which is Russian television, isn't particularly helpful. Everybody in Russia thinks that uh, Ukraine is, is the bad guy because they only hear one side, which is why it's so important to have a robust debate, which is why it's so important to have multiple um, outlets. Uh, but at the same token, is that in, in some ways, we've sort of a little bit lost our way um, in the news organization. Um, but I will tell you that people in the news business, they work really hard. And, um, and, and we work really hard for you, for, for you, and we really, you know, we honestly, whether, whatever we think, we think you know, we want to do a good job, people. Let, but let me, you know, the, the viewers aren't always so good about this. Now, I'll give you an example. Um, for, I, was at, I was at Fox, as you know, for a number of years, and I can't tell you how many times people come up and complain about my network, as they do any network. They, always, you know, they, they see some of the network, and they think that, you know, you're, you're the network, even though you have your own particular lane. You, I mean, I don't, none of us ever controls any other shows on any of these networks. And I can't tell you, people come up to me and say, look, I'm sick and tired of uh, O.J. Simpson or whatever it was. I'm sick and tired of it. I want more human trafficking stories. I'm sick and tired of the politics and the screaming. I want human traffic stories. So I'd go to Fox and say, you know, maybe we ought to do a show on human trafficking. So I'd get on a plane, go all the way to Cambodia, um, do a story on human trafficking. The network would spend a bloody fortune because it's not cheap to do to do um, to do uh, stories out of, outside the studio. I'd come back and we'd put it. We'd do it in segments. We put it on a segment. We look at you can look at the minute by minute segment and the, the ratings. And so we do something like you know two people. I'm exaggerating, screaming at each other, exaggerating. And then you'd get to human trafficking. And as soon as that has happened, boom because it's a little bit like polls. People know what the right answer is. You're supposed to want to hear human trafficking, you know, because that, you know, that's sort of the decent thing. But the truth is, is that you know, we're all a little bit involved in sort of the, what's happened in the news business, because as long as you want to consume certain stuff, that's what you're going to get, because you vote with a remote control, we, because we can see your ratings. And so, well, the media may not be, you know, well, we have, a, we have a lot of improvement we need to do for ourselves, a lot of improvement. It's, you know, it's that we're, in some ways, some of the viewers can be co-conspirators in terms of the, the decay. Um, I, now, I, Roger Kosak was my co-host at CNN, also a lawyer. And uh, Roger and I used to always say that, uh, uh, is that uh, people would come up to us at, at CNN early in the early days, they didn't like us because we were lawyers, and they'd say, well, you're lawyers. And so we were like, there's something wrong with us. And maybe there is. Um, and, uh, and Roger and I, as soon as they left the room, we'd say, yeah, uh, we took an exam of competency, called a bar exam. We took a course in evidence, which taught us the difference between opinion and fact. Um, and we had a code of professional responsibility. And I'm not suggesting we regulate the news business at all, because I'm, I'm a very strong supporter of the First Amendment. But you can see how, you know, is it, and, and less, and less from even a management company, is that there's a strong commitment to fact, a strong commitment for separating the fact from that all important, robust debate that gets us thinking, that gets people like Tommy Thompson to be able to negotiate and talk to people of the other party. That, 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 I can't tell you how important opinion is. But as long as we continue to blur it, 
we're gonna continue to have more problems. And I think it's incumbent upon management to do its best job to draw as much of a yellow line separately as it can. Um, another problem is in every business is money. And um, it's so cheap to keep people in a studio. I can't even tell you how cheap. The minute you have moved 15 miles from the studio, you have just cost the, the network a fortune. So with the, with the economic pressures, is that the networks are doing less news gathering because they can't afford it, and keeping more people in studios. Another problem, and, and, and my two colleagues may address it, is that it is, it's so easy, at least in Washington, for a political reporter, which drives a lot of the venom. Political reporting is really, when we, when we have reporting on tornadoes, or on hurricanes, or on fires, you don't, hear, you don't hear the divide. People aren't fighting. People are trying to figure out how to get food to people. But when you do political reporting, that's when you start to do dividing. Well, take a look. Next time you read a, um, a political story, or listen to it on TV, find, just check how many people are anonymous sources, like someone close to the president, or someone close to someone, someone familiar with the story, or whatever it is. You never get to test who it is, so you don't know even how much value to give to it. But because reporters, is that there, it, in the past few years, at least my opinion, in the past many decades, there's been less pressure to make people go on the record. Because when people go on the record, they're more responsible of what they say, number one. And, and um, number two is that we don't have drive-by smears. I mean, it's so easy to ambush. Like, I don't like you. Okay, well, I'll just do an I'll just do an anonymous statement about these two and say something. And no, I, I don't leave any fingerprints. And, and, and you know, and I've smeared them. I get everybody mad. You know, but so you know, so the the overuse anonymous anonymous sources very important. But it, but we but in limited I mean, in in limited circumstances. You know, national security, whistleblowing, or something. Else. But every political story now is practically everyone is someone close to, someone familiar with, someone whatever. And so you see that you know in in, in I I think news organizations it would behoove us since we know you don't like us anymore. We got that message. We got it. We know it. It would behoove us to have some self reflection, even think about it. Say how can we do our better job our job better. But remember, you all are voting with your remote, and that's also very important. Um, so anyway, um, I hope I haven't said anything got me into trouble. I usually do, which is a problem. Um, but anyway, so thank you very much. I'll turn it over to my colleagues. I'm extremely flattered. I watch. The record of Greta Van Susteren at least two or three times a week, and here she's here go, going to watch my PowerPoint. Okay. That said, let me give. Um, so um, I'm the one professor on the panel. Uh, I'm going to use PowerPoint. Um, uh, let me give you a warning. My uh, my wife and I had our first child. My wife is in labor. She finally gets an epidural, and she says, "Oh." Oh, it feels so good. Oh, I just want to go to sleep. She looks at me and says, tell me about your research. <laughs> and she did. <laughs> so uh, here is uh, the book I wrote. Uh, this is a little dated. It's uh, a little over 10 years old. Uh, the, the, the main thing I wanted to do in that book was come up with an, ob an objective, quantitative way to measure media bias. And so uh, I'm going to talk about this. I'm going to have a number that says the slant of these various outlets. Uh, and I'm going to say a number that's the center on the scale, what would be unbiased. Now, it all started, so that book was like 2012, maybe 2011, but it all started with a, a paper uh, that I wrote with uh, my co-author, Jeff Milo, uh, in a peer-reviewed journal, Quarterly Journal of Economics. And this is where it started. Th this is the one we said, let's try to find a, a measure of media bias that's objective and quantitative. Now, here's, here's how it, uh, it all got started. Uh, before I started that, before this was like mm, 2000 or so uh, when I started that research, before that, I got my PhD in 1992, I, I began my career um, with one of my main research focuses was Congress. I was actually a political scientist when I began my career. And um, within congressional studies, those of us who do the studies, um, we never argue over where politicians are, who is more right-wing, who is more left-wing. So for instance, if I can pick two, we would never argue whether, say, uh, Jim DeMint, I don't know if he's retired, but um, uh, 
pretty conservative uh, uh, senator from South Carolina. We'd never argue whether he is more conservative than, say, Jack Kemp, or, or is he more conservative than Olympia Snow? And the reason we had these measures, now these measures, there's something like two dozen of them in political science, and we use them frequently. Just about all of them are based on roll call votes. And so, for instance, the oldest one available is called the Americans for Democratic Action. This is an interest group, calls itself liberal, started in 1947. Okay. So what it started doing, this is the first one to do this. In, in 1947, it started picking 20 or so roll call votes every year, and then it would decide whether the yay or nay alternative is the right way to vote, the liberal way to vote, and then they would give every politician a scorecard, and they would give them a score, zero to 100, which say how liberal they are. Okay, there's a little technical issue. I use these scores to make comparisons over time. To do that, I had to adjust the scales, and for that reason, some of these scores are gonna be slightly under uh, zero or slightly above 100, but here, here are the scores. These, these are the scores that we congressional scholars say, these are from the Americans for Democratic Action. We don't argue over who's uh, more liberal or more conservative. As you might see, uh, I told you some of the most conservative. Um, I have two slides, by the way, and they go from a very conservative to very liberal. Nancy Pelosi's about 100 on this scale. Uh, Jim DeMint, uh, Michelle Bachman, you might remember her, are about a zero on the scale. Um, and then it goes to about 50. By, by my estimate, um, I, I can go into the Q&A, the average voter in America is about a 50 on this scale. And so this happens to be the score that Arlen Specter had when he was a senator from um, uh, from Pennsylvania. So this is um, this is when he was a Republican. He, he switched. Uh, do I put it? He, he switched to Democrat and became a little more liberal. His score went up to 67 from 50. But 50, that's uh, by my measure, is is uh, about the average voter. By my estimates, the average voter it's about an Arlen Specter. Okay. Uh, by the way. Um, on my website, if you want to, I call these now uh, political quotients rather than adjusted ADA scores. So if, if any of you want to compute your own political quotient, you can go on my website and I have 10 questions and I've summarized some of these roll call, a sample of these roll call votes. You can answer these questions and decide what your own PQ is. Okay. Um, once I do that, okay, I try to make to put the media on this scale, and I want to say things like, is the New York Times more or less conservative than the Arlen Specter? Is Fox News uh, more or less conservative than Newt Gingrich? So how do I do that? Okay, let me give an example to say how this is done. If you can look at this graph, I'm not sure if you can see, third one from the top is New York Times, okay? If you follow the arrow from New York Times, you get to a tick mark, turns out it's 75, but next to that tick mark is Joe Lieberman. So you may remember him, Democratic senator, well, he was a Democratic senator, but then switched to, to independent. But when he was a Democrat, he was uh, a, a fairly moderate, I, I would say. So uh, he was Al Gore's uh, vice presidential candidate. Um, I think he voted, I don't know, he, he definitely criticized Clinton. Anyway, he, a lot of people would say that he's on the moderate side of the Democratic Party. By these vote scores, though, he's not a 50. He's still left of center. But anyway, my method finds that the New York Times, their slant is about the same as Joe Lieberman's political quotient. Now, what does that mean? What it means, in particular, is that the average New York Times article sounds about as liberal or conservative as the average Joe Lieberman speech, okay? So I have this big data set, lots of speeches by Joe Lieberman, all the politicians in Congress, and we have a method, my co-author and I, a statistical method that said that the, the average New York Times article sounds about like a Joe Lieberman speech. More specific, the key data we use was citations to think tanks. So we had a big data set. We looked at these 200 think tanks, which had a range of right-wing to left-wing to centrist think tanks. And what we had a statistical method in a computer program that did this, and what it concluded is that when the New York Times cites these think tanks, it picks a mix that is approximately the same mix that Joe Lieberman picks when he makes speeches on the Senate floor, okay? So once we decided that, we said, well, that means what I now call the slant quotient of the New York Times 
is equal to the political quotient of Joe Lieber, and that's a 75. So on this scale, I give New York Times a 75. Okay, you can see various, we have 20 news outlets that we examine. Um, let's see, uh, all 20, let's see, 18 out of the 20 were left of center. By the way, I said, I, I estimated that 50 is the average voter, so anything above a 50 is left of center. There were two, which a lot of people would call conservative outlets, uh, this is Fox News special report in Washington Times, and we found those were right of center, okay? But not far right of center. We found that they're only about uh, as conservative as a Susan Collins uh, or maybe an Olympia Snow, which are sometimes called the, the, the uh, rhino Republicans, okay? Um, when we do this, so we use think tank citations. You could use a lot of other different data. The key is, though, is just the, uh, the thought experiment to say, let's listen to a media outlet and try to say, which politician do they sound most like? Now, I'm gonna put her on the spot. I watch Greta Van Sus from the record. Um, to me, when I do this thought experiment, she sounds like a Susan Collins. Maybe she will comment on that later. So I, I would put her just barely right of center, right-leaning moderate. Um, I'll see what, what, if she agrees with that or not. But the key is that's the thought experiment that you do. And that's the way that my co-author and I could rate these uh, various news outlets. Okay, uh, okay, I'm gonna skip all this. Uh, I also estimate the effect of the media in the book. I'm gonna skip that. Once you measure the effect of the media, I do a thought experiment. What if the media didn't have any bias? And there's a little bit of math, a lot of assumptions, but I can answer the thought experiment, at least give an answer, maybe it's wrong, but I can give an answer. What would America think and vote like if there wasn't any media bias, okay? So currently, America thinks and votes like a voter with a PQ, political quotient of 50. That's a voter who is like the average voter in a typical purple state. So it's like the average Wisconsin, by the way. Average Georgian, okay? That is the way America thinks and votes. According to my thought experiment, the assumptions, the mathematical model, um, if we could run this, get rid of the media bias, how would America think and vote? By my estimate, it would move about 25 points to the right, that is, the average American, instead of act, thinking and act, thinking and voting like the average Wisconsin, would think and vote about like the average Texan or North Dakotan. Turns out Tennessee and Kentucky are about the, also similar states. Uh, okay, um, what did I do on time? Um, so that's what I did. Some people have asked me, uh, uh, have you done any updates? And, and basically no. Uh, but I, there is a, a great anecdote that I think illustrates my results and says maybe they were wrong, uh, maybe how the media has changed. And this anecdote involves Tom Cotton. So you may recall, so right after George Floyd died, there's uh, uh, protests, some say they turned into riots. Um, some people were talking about invoking, what is it, the insurrection act, okay. Uh, by the way, I'm gonna fly through this. I'm not gonna give a good summary. I have found only re uh, within the last couple months, I read Batya's book, chapter eight. She has the very best summary and analysis of this incident. So I'm gonna go quickly through this. They're talking about whether to invoke the Insurrection Act. Okay, um, what happens? The opinion editors at the New York Times decide, well, maybe we should say something about this. And so they decide to have an entire page of, they're gonna have four articles on this. All the editors, by the way, were against invoking the Insurrection Act. By the way, the Insurrection Act would allow the president to have the National Guard aid law enforcement in these protests slash riots. The New York Times editors are against that, but they decide, well, let's have three pieces for people who are against it, and then one person, one piece, or someone who's for it. They find out Tom Cotton is for it, and they invite him to give, give a piece. Once that happens, um, the New York Times, uh, the, the, the staff just go berserk, um, and they basically start uh, protesting You're on Twitter, there's emails to the publishers, they're asking the publisher to have a town hall, and the, the publishers eventually give in to what I, I call the mob. This was like the, the staff members of the New York Times, and they fire the the main opinion page editor uh, who, who decided to run the, the Tom Cotton article. Um, now, 
uh, one key aspect of this is that the backlash came not from the opinion people at the New York Times, it came from the reporters. The reporters are the ones who were uniformly, almost uniformly against this. Um, I want to argue that they, now, b by the way, if you saw my um, slide five or so ago, I said the New York Times had a 75 slant quotient about the, about, uh, the PQ of, of Joe Lieberman. Turns out that's left of center, but not f as far left as the average Democrat in Congress. That's what I found, okay? One question I ask, is that right? Is that right, or did they change? And I would argue from this incident, the New York Times staff members acted more liberal than the average Democrat in Congress. Now, why do I think that? The reason is that whenever there, now I used to be a congressional scholar, whenever there is a major bill in Congress, this happens every time, uh, there will, the, the majority party will decide how they're gonna debate and amend that bill, and always, the majority party gives half the time to the minority party. You can look this up in the congressional record. It happens all the time. I would argue, though, the New York Times was not willing to do anything like this. Not only were they not willing to give half the debate time, to, they couldn't allow anyone. They couldn't allow Tom Cotton even one speech. And I would argue <laughs> that does not happen in Congress. The Democrats in Congress would actually be... Um, uh, 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 more accom accommodative to someone with, with views on the other side. So the, the final point I'll, I would say, I think either I underestimated how liberal the New York Times is or maybe the New York Times actually moved left since I did my research. So my, my uh, final point I would say, if an Elon Musk type billionaire bought the New York Times and instead fired all the news, the, the news reporters there, and instead filled the newsroom with clones of Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer, I would argue that the newsroom would actually become slightly more conservative than it is now. Okay, I'll end there, thanks. Mm -hmm. So first of all, thank you so much for having me um, to the Tommy Thompson Center, um, to the Dean, to Ruth. It's just such an honor to be here. I'm so humbled to be in this incredible company, and it's such a pleasure to be here. Um, my book picks up exactly where yours <laughs> left off, so it's going to be a really nice um, compliment. I, I do have to say I, I, I disagree a little bit with you that um, the news media shapes the opinions of Americans. I, I think we have a lot less power than we would like to think. <laughs> um, all right. When I was promoting my book, Bad News, How Woke Media is Undermining Democracy, I was asked a lot what made me passionate about the subject of the media. The truth is, <laughs> it wasn't something I was super passionate about. I had initially set out to write a book on an entirely different topic. I'd been doing a lot of reporting in the South during the Trump years, and I was finding, as a liberal in good standing at the time, something that was pretty surprising to me. I was shocked to learn that on the most important issues, on the values that this great nation was founded upon, there just isn't very much of a partisan divide anymore. Um, and maybe you guys know this because you have the pleasure and privilege of living in a state where you regularly encounter people you disagree with, but those of us who live in New York um, don't have that pleasure as much. Um, and what I was finding was that when it came to issues like the fundamental importance of treating every American with dignity, the evils of racism, acceptance for interracial and same-sex marriages, even things like fighting mass incarceration and police brutality and fighting for workers' rights, a lot less divided us as Americans um, than united us, which I think is very um, appropriate for uh, the institution we're speaking at right now. Um, the polling bears this out over and over again. Take a statistic, for example, that came out last year from Gallup, measuring approval for interracial marriage between black people and white people. So Gallup first started asking Americans about their feelings on the subject back in 1958, when approval for interracial marriage was at an abysmal 4%. 
as of 22, approval for interracial marriage has reached a near unanimous high of 94%. And there's almost no difference between regions. So Southern Americans now approve of interracial marriage at the same rate as their Eastern, Midwestern, and Western neighbors. As recently as 1991, approval for interracial marriage in the South was at just 33%, compared to 50% in the Midwest, 54% in the East, and 60% in the West. Today, it's at 93%, 93%, 94%, and 97% in the South, Midwest, East, and West, respectively. Something similar happened on the subject of gay marriage. Approval among Republicans has absolutely skyrocketed uh, for gay marriage in recent years, from 16% approval in 1995 to 55% approval as of last year, including 61% of young Republicans. So that trend is very clearly going in one direction. Even on abortion, an issue that the media and our politicians often tell us is hugely divisive, more unites us than divides us. The vast majority of Americans actually agree, by and large, when it comes to abortion. They oppose abortion bans, and they want it to be generally legal in the first trimester in cases of rape, incest, and mother's health, and that's about it. So support for abortion craters when you ask respondents across the country um, about the second or third trimesters. I talk to working class Americans every week across the country who work side by side with folks who disagree with them on politics and they tell me the same thing over and over. We do not have the luxury of hating our coworkers who vote for the other party. We just rely on them too much. It just doesn't matter as much as having a good working relationship. Um, so what does all this have to do with the media? <laughs> well, it's true that our elites in the political and chattering classes and those who run corporations and big tech companies are increasingly partisan, and that's because they are making millions and millions of dollars consolidating power around trying to make Americans hate each other. And yet, despite their best efforts, polarization remains, by and large, an elite phenomenon. Somehow, by the grace of God, despite the billions and billions of dollars spent trying to make us hate each other, Americans are more united than they are divided. Uh, would you read a book about this? <laughs> because um, I would, I wanted to write a book about this, but I unfortunately couldn't get a single editor to agree to publish it. Um, at publishing house after publishing house, I was told the same thing, there is no market for this kind of message. And finally, at the last drinks appointment I had before the COVID lockdown, a very kind editor sat me down and said to me, look, you're telling me that we're not as divided, we're not as polarized, why do I think we are? She was like, maybe you should write that book, and I think that's actually the book that I wrote. Um, I sought to answer the question, why the unity that has finally enveloped us in this nation on the most important issues is so invisible to us. And what I found was surprising to me. It's not invisible because our media is partisan politically, but because it is partisan on behalf of the elites, on both sides. It has erased the average American from view to cater to affluent liberals or rich conservatives and no one else. It caters to the Americans who benefit the most from the narrative of polarization, so that is what it reflects back to them. Especially the liberal media, which accounts for, I mean, I think it, I thought it was 94% um, of, of, so we know that 94% of political donations made by journalists in 2016 were made to Democrats. So it's maybe a little bit higher than the numbers um, you were citing. So 94% of journalists who made uh, donation, political donations donated to Democrats, right? That's, it's 94%. I mean, it's a staggering, staggering figure. 91% of the New York Times' readership now is Democrats, right? So, I mean, it's, it's, it's staggering. Um, um, especially in the liberal media, which accounts for about 94% of our news outlets, has limited the viewpoints that are allowed in the mainstream media to the views of a tiny section of the American public, and that tiny section is an economic and cultural elite whose views are very, very distant from those of average Americans on most issues, from gender to race to immigration to the economy to COVID. Liberal newsrooms at legacy media companies aren't just more liberal than most Americans, and here's where I'm gonna pick up from where you left off. So the shorthand for what they have become is in the last 10 years, let's say 10 years, five years, um, they've gone from being liberal, which they always were, to being, yes, I'm gonna use the dreaded word, woke. Uh, <laughs> I know it's controversial, so allow me to define what I mean by it. When I say woke, I'm not using the word to refer to what it used to mean when it was coined by black activists in the 70s, who used the term stay woke as shorthand for stay away, aware of the ways that the state continues to deny black Americans equal protections before the law and an equal shot at the American dream. I obviously think that 
that's incredibly important. Um, and I'm actually very gratified to see that this has increasingly become an important topic for conservatives. Um, I'm using the word woke the way that sociologists have started to use it to refer to something that happened in 2015, which is when white liberals started showing up in polls with more extremist views on race than black and Hispanic Americans. In a phenomena that social scientists dubbed the Great Awakening, polling in 2015 started to show that white liberals had adopted a very academic lens in thinking about race and gender. They started to express the belief that minorities have less agency than white Americans, and they started to express the view that power and privilege and agency are the exclusive provenance of white people, while people of color are routinely denied these things systematically, and the word they love is systemically. So a Yale study from 2018 summarized the effects of the Great Awakening very nicely. The study found a difference between how white liberals and white conservatives talk to people of color. And it was this, here's the difference. This Yale study from 2018 found that when white people talk to people of color, white liberals will dumb down their vocabulary. And white conservatives don't do this, okay? <laughs> here's a quote from the study. Most whites, particularly socio-political liberals, now endorse racial equality. Archival and experimental research reveals a subtle but reliable ironic consequence. White liberals present less competence to minorities than to other whites. That is, they patronize minorities stereotyped as lower status and less competent. Just think about that for a minute. When white liberals encounter black and Latino Americans, they immediately stereotype them as lower status and start to use lower level vocabulary, and white conservatives don't do this. By the way, if you tell any of your black friends about this study, they'll immediately be like, yeah, we all know that. Um, it's just it's something that's very much in the air. I'm sure a lot of you recognize this is true. I remember when I first read this study, I, I had a very dark night of the soul, um, and it was very much an awakening moment for me. That is wokeness in a nutshell, believing that the color of someone's skin immediately marks them as lower status than you and in need of your beneficence, of your patronage, of your compensation. It's disgusting and it is deeply, deeply racist, but whether they know it or not, this is how many white progressives have started to think and behave, especially those at the top of the socioeconomic spectrum, which is not coincidentally also those most likely to call themselves progressives. And that's the link I'm gonna be making here is the connection between progressive ideology and a certain class economic status. That that is really the, the link I'm gonna try to make and I think where things picked up right when, where your book left off. A recent Pew Research Center study made this clear when it found that just 6% of Americans identify as progressives. Progressives are the whitest and the most highly educated of the groups that make up the Democratic coalition, and it's these progressives, these 6%, who have the most woke views on race. For example, the view that, um, here's the quote, most US laws and major institutions need to be completely rebuilt because they are fundamentally biased against some racial and ethnic groups. So 6% of Americans are in the group that would say yes to that. Meanwhile, just 6% of black Americans are in that progressive group. Okay, so this is a very, very white, progressive way of thinking. So where did these white progressives get this view if it doesn't reflect the views of actual minorities? Well, in this, I would agree with you. I think that the media played a huge role in the Great Awakening. Data shows that starting in 2011, not incidentally, the year that the New York Times erected its paywall online, so meaning it started to invest all of its resources into going digital as opposed to print, Words like white privilege and marginalized and people of color in the same sentence as marginalized to create that association began to absolutely skyrocket, first at the New York Times and then across liberal digital media. And why did the New York Times start doing this? So there's two main factors that I talk about at length in the book. The first is an internal business model of digital media, which I'll get to in a minute. And the second is the makeup of who are the journalists, the journalist class. 
so the Great Awakening was really the culmination of lo a long-term process that had been underway for decades, a status revolution among journalists, um, to where journalism used to be a very low-status working-class trade. So the kind of person who would become a journalist would be like the kid sitting in the back of the room, like cracking wise at the teacher, super anti-authoritarian, couldn't follow orders, would always get kicked out of the classroom. And when all of his friends went to work at the factory, he was just too anti-authoritarian. It would have been dangerous to have him there. So instead he went to Washington, where he saw his job as like demanding respect and demanding accountability on behalf of his friends who were working in the factory. And he still lived in a community like that. Today, the kind of person who becomes a journalist is the kid, someone like me, who sat in the front of the room like this, every time the teacher asked a question, Mimi, I know the answer, I know the answer, and the teacher has to pretend they can't see you to give the other kids like a chance, like somebody super comfortable with authority, somebody who's like an A student who goes to an elite university and then another elite university and gets a graduate degree. So in 1931, less than 30% of journalists had a college degree, less than 30%, and many of them didn't even have a high school diploma. Because actually, you can't teach journalism. I mean, not, you, you, Greta, you didn't get a journalism degree. You got a law, a law degree because you wanted to learn how to think. You can't really teach someone how to be a good listener. I mean, um, in 2015, 92% of journalists had a college degree, and most had a graduate degree. So the milieu of who are journalists are the kind of people who they go to school, they go to elite institutions with people who end up being billionaires or politicians who they're supposed to be in an adversarial relationship with, but they have total class solidarity with because they went to school with these people and their kids go to school with them and they live in the same fancy neighborhoods. The argument that I make in the book is that the racial and gender views of the far left are a product of their economic privilege and college credentialing much more than anything else, and that this is the real divide in this country, the class divide separating the college educated from those without a degree. And the partisanship we see in the media is fueled by the deep contempt that over-credentialed elites have for the two-thirds of this country who make their living with their hands. It may look like we have a partisan media, but what we actually have is a situation where liberal media outlets, which represent the majority by far, are made up of and cater to an economic elite with the privilege of having wild views on race and gender, mostly as a smokescreen for the way that they themselves are benefiting from economic inequality. After all, if you convince people that the real divide in this country is racial or about gender, all of those working class folks who vote for the other party are just racist, Nobody's going to point out that your side is hoarding the American dream for the upper quintile because they'll be too busy trying to defend themselves from the horrifying accusation that they are racist or transphobic or what have you. It's just a big distraction mechanism, in other words, and our legacy media is just dripping with this. That's what's new here, not the political partisanship of the media. American media has a rich history of being deeply partisan and having no distinction between opinion and fact. In fact, something that I point out in the book is that, you know, at the turn of the century, if you were a communist living in New York City, there were so many communist newspapers, there were 10 communist newspapers that you wouldn't dream of reading because it was the wrong form of communism, right? Those papers were not objective. They did not distinguish between opinion and fact, but they were representing the masses because there were masses of them. So most of the media was created for the working class and represented the working class. Um, Every, uh, that started to shift in the post-war era because our class divide was in a state of abeyance and so was our political one. American journalism throughout the post-war era was built on catering to the broadest spectrum of American society. As a result, journalists, always more liberal than Americans more broadly, were forced to do the hard work of persuasion. So this was in the post-war era. Because the business model of the news for those 30 years, from let's say 1950 to 1980, it relied on, the business model relied on having the largest, most bipartisan audience possible. Liberals couldn't indulge in navel-gazing or demonizing those who didn't agree with them, even those with truly sordid views. They had to address the concerns and discomfort of those who disagreed with them um, because that was their customer base. Right? You had tons of towns across America where they were one newspaper towns, right? But it was before the big sorting. There was a lot more communities like this one. So you would have a town that was you know, 40% Republican and 60% Democrat. And the owner of the publication could choose. I could al allow my journalists to be super left the way they want to be and get 60% you know, of this readership. I could al you know, allow my columnists, the columnists were always more conservative, to be more conservative and get 40%. Or I can force them to report the news straight 
and have a balanced editorial page and get 100% of the town's readership. So that's what they did. There was a business model, a business rationale for why the news had that kind of unbiased feel to it. Today, we're seeing that process that was so successful throughout the 20th century reverse itself, and once again, the media is playing a crucial role. And here's where the business end of the media comes into it. So unlike print newspapers and magazines that made their money through circulation, digital media is powered by engagement and subscriptions, and engagement is key. Because the engagement model of making your money, it, does, it relies on the opposite of catering to that great American middle. It, it, because of course, like the most engaged people online are the most extreme, right? So if you are going to say, my money is to be made in engagement, you're never gonna be going for the middle even though there's more people in the middle because what you want is outrage. And I like to say, every time you get angry at a stranger on the internet, somebody just made a million dollars. And I think that's the, ac the accurate number for it. Um, as a result, the same liberal media outlets that caressed America into a more tolerant society throughout the 20th century are now committed to another business model which involves enraging affluent progressives and turning them against their fellow Americans who don't share their views. Back when they were catering to the vast middle, America's liberal media managed to change a once racist nation into one that overwhelmingly favors Dr. King's vision that the only society worth living in is a colorblind society. Today, America's leftist media, places like the New York Times, uh, chasing cliques of an overeducated progressive elite, demonize people who share Dr. King's vision as racist for daring to erase the rarefied privilege of the marginalized. America's liberal media once turned the nation in favor of gay marriage by targeting middle and working class readers and viewers, convincing them that they they too might know somebody excluded from the joys of marriage due to their sexual orientation. Today, legacy outlets demonize those who oppose children undergoing surgery to change their gender as bigots, erasing homosexual identity in favor of a trans-focused politics. They call you a bigot if you think trans women shouldn't be competing on women's sports teams, even though 83% of Americans hold that view. 83% of Americans do not think that trans athletes should be allowed to compete on teams with girls. So th that's not a partisan divide, right? Because 83% of Americans are not conservative. That is what I, what I think is a class divide. Just think about that for a minute. 94% of our media is catering to 17% of Americans in the best case scenario. That's not political partisanship, that's the elites versus everybody that they have contempt for. Of course, the right has its version of this. People who disagree with the right's stance on abortion or transgender issues are smeared as baby killers or groomers, which is equally appalling. Chasing digital traffic, the media outlets of both sides have abandoned the vast middle to make money and consolidate power for elites, and economic policy has followed a pace, NAFTA, globalization, the decimation of the American working class. That is a disaster for any dem democratic society to say nothing of the trust in the media, which is, of course, at historic lows, as has been mentioned a few times. But make no mistake about it, the mistrust of our media outlets stems 100% from the contempt that the elites in our media have for middle America, for the working class, for anyone without a college degree. They think their rarefied credentials give them the right to tell people what to think, to lecture people who work 10 times harder than them and live lives that are unimaginably more difficult. They deserved to lose that trust. Thank you so much. Can I just say something after mine too? It's, uh, first of all, they both made me think, and I love this. This is so fantastic. But I, I, it, both of them made me think of an anecdote back to, that'll, you, that'll resonate with all of you. Back in 2012, I was sitting in my office late at night and Governor Mitt Romney, now senator, had chosen uh, Speaker of the House, uh, Ralph Ryan, to be his running mate. And I was sitting there, and when you're in the TV business, you have like about 10 TVs and you keep hitting the room remote all the time. And I listened to all the pundits talk about it, and I went home that night and laughed with my husband that we need to get them a book of synonyms because every single one of them, we go, that's a bold choice. They flip here, that's a bold choice. Bold choice. And I go home and I say, what are the odds that they all use the same synonym? It's because they all go to the same parties, they all hang around with each other, they're not thinking anything new, and between the time of the appointment and the time they all hit air, that they'd all talk to, to each other. This is across every single news story, which is one problem, is because they're not coming out and talking to all of you. They're sitting, in, they're sitting in Washington or New York for that bold choice. So we used to make a joke about getting them all a book of synonyms to come up with something else. But that, but that really you know, you know, capsulized what you, what you both said, among other things you said. 
<laughs> Thank you. Uh, sort of following up on that, I just wanted to ask Greta, you've been really on the ground. Uh, we've been watching you on TV for you know much of the period that uh, both Tim and Vatya have been talking about. You know, what is your reaction to their interpretation of what's I happening? Does this I, resonate it's, with it's, you? It's eye opening. It's shocking. Um, you know, it's. I sort of don't want to like even know. You, know, you hope journalists are out there doing their own work and doing their individual work. But when you hear them, it's it's a, it's basically a crowd. It's based, no one, no one's thinking. Look, um, and I'll tell one more anecdote. Is that when um, Lisa Murkowski got beaten in the primary in Alaska a number of years ago when she was running for the Republican nominee, she decided to run as a write-in, which was ridiculous. I mean, who wins a write-in in the Senate? And so um, anyway, when it came time to have a debate, um, Fox News sent me up to New York to cover the debate. It was the one who'd run the Republican nomination, the Democrat, and this write-in candidate, Lisa Murkowski, who was obviously had gotten thrown out, but she was now running as independent. I get up to Alaska, and every place I looked, there were signs, Lisa Murkowski, Lisa Murkowski, Lisa Murkowski. Then I turn on the local TV, and I find out that Senator Ted Stevens, who had just been killed in a, in a plane accident, had, had cut an ad for her, basically right before he died. He was beloved, and he said, vote for Lisa Murkowski. So I go back to Washington, and I look like I got you know horns and six eyes. I say, I think Lisa Murkowski is going to win. Now, that was ridiculous. Who wins is a write-in. But here's the difference, is because I wasn't sitting around the newsroom, it's because Fox spent the money. And you would all thought the same thing. I'm not a brilliant, I'm not a great visionary. I just looked. And that's you know one of the problems that these, all the reporters, because it costs money to send them out, we're all, we're, they got this herd mentality. And so we all say, Lisa Murkowski is not gonna win. Well, sure enough, she did win as a writer. But it wasn't great brilliance on my part, but it's that we're not doing independent thinking and we all think we know more than you do. So if you'll allow a little bit of uh, navel gazing here by an academic, and I think we're all probably a little overeducated here, we're on a college campus. Uh, that's, that's not my problem. <laughs> <laughs> How much is, uh, does academia, if at all, play a role in this? And I'll, uh, I say that in part uh, based on two observations. Uh, first, Patia, you, know, you observed 94% you know, of donations from journalists. Um, uh, going to, to Democrats. Uh, There's a study that said, up the, uh, at least English departments in the top 300 universities, less than half a percent go to Republicans of, of uh, donation. So, uh, and I think the, the same way some of the sort of great awakening, I think seems to have at least uh, happened first on, on campus. I think there were some on campus who sort of, uh, um, at least I felt like at the time seeing as well, this is just campus. And, and then, you know, a year or two later, you hear it elsewhere. So is academia part of this? And yeah, do we play a role in this? Uh, I've thought lots about this. Um, one, because I live in academia. And I must say, when I wrote my book, um, uh, I quoted uh, various uh, polls that said of, of mainstream media, something like 92% vote for the Democrat. But you said 94% give money, and I've seen actually maybe like 96 or 97. Um, anyway, it's a lot. Uh, when I was at UCLA, uh, I remember in the political science department, there were only two Republicans. We had about the exact same ratio. And so uh, I've thought about this. What, what it, it, have people become more liberal because of the media, because of, of academia? And if so, which has been more important? I, I would have told you 15 years ago, I think I would have said academia, that what your, your influential years when you're in college, that's what's causing people uh, to become more liberal. Uh, since then, though, I, I want to say I don't know. Uh, uh, it'd be very hard to get a definitive answer on this. You'd almost have to get an experiment to do this. But I have seen studies that show that uh, surveys, that they ask kids, what are your views when, you, when you're a freshman, what are your views as a senior? They become more liberal, but they, they go back to being a little more conservative once they get out. And that's consistent 
with some uh, studies from academics, uh, uh, some media studies that have looked at what they call the half-life of persuasion. And here's one of the best studies ever on this. A Yale political scientist named Alan Gerber, somehow he and his colleagues got Rick Perry. When Rick Perry was running for governor, I think the first time in Texas, they convinced the campaign to do an experiment with these radio ads. They said, okay, we know you're gonna run these radio ads. Let us flip coins to decide which counties you run them in and which ones you don't. So they had a, a, a genuine experiment. They, they found that these radio ads, sure enough, made people want to vote more for, for Rick Perry. But then they looked at the half-life of this effect. So the, the, the studies found something like it, the, the radio ads increased the vote share by like 6% to, to, to Rick Perry. But these researchers called the people back two weeks later, four weeks later, eight weeks later, asked them the same question. And they found that that 6% bump started eroding. It would erode 6% to 3% to 1.5%. They called it the half-life. And they calculated how long is that half-life. And what they found was astounding. I would have never guessed this. It was like two weeks. Something like within two weeks, whatever effect you have of this persuasion device goes away. So given that, I thought, well, that kind of makes sense. When you're, in, when you're in college, if everything is, you know, two weeks, once you leave, that, that effect is going to erode very quickly. The only way to, to make people more liberal is you're going to have to almost have a constant bombardment. So you have this persuasion, not just when you're in college, but every week you're having to get this. So th for that reason, I've, I'm kind of leaning to the fact that the media uh, have more of an important effect than academia does. Um, I just want to say, I, I hope it's clear. I don't think, I, I consider myself to be on the left, and I don't think it's bad to be liberal. I don't think we should be trying to make people less liberal. What I, the point I'm trying to make, I think, and that probably we're all trying to make, um, is that, um, you, especially as students, you should be allergic to any um, sense that like everyone in the room Everyone in the institution, everyone in the city has the same views as you. Like, that is the important point. Like, if there is no one in your life who is regularly challenging you and regularly saying things you don't agree with, you're going to become lazy, comfortable, and stupid. Like, that just happens because there's nobody forcing you to up your game and challenge yourself and keep asking, did I, did I arrive at this opinion due to facts? Did I really look at the facts hard enough? Did I really? So I, I just want to make that clear. Like, it's not that it's like bad, you know, to be on one side or the other. It's that um, universities are uniformly liberal. The media is, you know, very, very, very left, and that that is the problem. Um, the the in terms of which has a, a bigger impact. I'm a populist. I, I really think that like um, people know what's right for them. I don't believe that you can like. Um, hypnotize somebody into thinking a certain thing or voting a certain way. Um, I, I do think that um, right now there is a kind of culture afoot that suggests that you are the worst possible thing you can be if you don't hold a certain view. So anywhere where people are not being offered like an alternative to that or a, a, a safe space in which to say, well, what do I really think? Do I really agree with that? Do I really believe with that? Um, that's going to have like a very corrosive effect. I have seen a study, I don't know if it's any good, that um, younger generations would get much more liberal in college and then become much less so as they got older, you know, as they made their money, <laughs> as they bought property, but that that's not happening with millennials. Um, that they're sort of staying, sticking with it. So I, I don't, but I, I really, really, really reject the idea that the media influences people. I, I just think that the people are much better than the media and they know it. <laughs> well, so I think part of what I uh, wanted to ask you, just to uh, follow up on that a little, is not necessarily that they're competing, but uh, is the media sort of the mechanism by which academia might influence things? So in that sense, um, uh, is academia influencing journalists? You sort of talked a little bit about groupthink, and so many journalists, at least today, are going to, you know, are highly educated and going to the same schools and so on. Well, I'll just answer very briefly. I mean, to me, the answer is like 100%, but it's not because of anything I think they're learning. I think it's because there is a divide in this country to where people who have a college degree have, 
First of all, they have longer life expectancies. They're going to be healthy overall. They're much less likely to commit deaths of despair, opioid addiction, suicide, al death by alcoholism. So their, their prospects are much higher. They're going to make, uh, on average, a million dollars more than a person without a degree. And instead of, uh, instead of accepting with humility their great fortune of having been blessed with this mechanism for upward mobility, they have taken to hoarding it and then to disguise the hoarding, looking down on people who don't have that degree. And that's been huge, it's decimating, because because of that point of view, our industrial you know, uh, economy has been decimated and our working class. So there, it has had a huge impact, but I don't know that it's anything they learned in academia. It's more that college divide. So uh, if I could put the, this question this way, is the problem uh, too much objectivity or too, too little, sort of? Oh. Is there, you know, should journalists be trying to be more objective or should we be trying to have you know, bias that points in other directions well, and people acknowledging their bias more in reporting. Can I take that one? That's where yeah. I think the divide between opinion and fact is so important. Look, you know, you know, there, there was one network that kept saying Trump and, and the big lie, the big lie. And I always thought that was sort of uh, insulting to the viewers because you don't have to, I mean, all you can say is that, you know, someone said something on Monday and then said something on Tuesday. You don't have to tell people it's a lie. I mean, we're pretty smart. We can figure that out. But it's sort of a little bit plays into the idea of the knowing it all and knowing it will tell you what it is, we'll tell you this is a lie. And I mean, that's, but that's a little bit of the arrogance of us, you know, is that, is that you know, is that we, all we do is tell you the facts. And then we can have a, then we can have a debate about the facts. We can have the robust debate, but uh, we're telling you that, you know, that's, that's a lie or whatever that is. When it's, you know, people are, people are smart as we are. Probably smarter. One, one, one point in my book, um, I, I would argue that the, the, the vast majority of stories in, in uh, the media, are, are truthful. It's very hard for me to find things that I think would be false. And in that sense, I would say that the, the, the media are objective. The problem is, is what they don't tell you. It's the crimes of omission. And that's part of the point of my book, is that there's certain facts. For instance, I analyzed a case where when uh, George W. Bush was president, he, he introduced his tax cuts. There were some people who were saying that the rich are going to get more than their share their, their disproportionate share of the benefits of these tax cuts. Turns out that was true, okay? But there was another fact that the, the tax cuts actually would have made the tax system more progressive. So there were two facts. One, all the liberals were saying, were emphasizing, and another, all the conservatives were saying. And I'd say neither side is saying anything that's false, but they're not giving you the, the whole side of the story. And so what, that's the, case, the main thing I try to do in my book is to look, well, what would the moderates in Congress do? And it turns out those two facts, the moderates in Congress, were giving the, them about equal share. And, but the, the, journal, the mainstream journalists were not. Um, so th that's my main point. I, it, I, the, the other thing too, though, so we go back to my, my complaint, is that not enough journalists are being sent out to actually do news gathering. Look, a lot of times the people, they're reading it on the internet and then turning around writing it or telling you. I mean, you could have gotten it yourself. I mean, that's a little bit because of the economic uh, pressures on all these news organizations, is that they're getting from the, s you could go get the same source because news gathering is so expensive. It's so expensive. I think that this touches a little bit on, I think, an idea at least uh, in academia, maybe it goes back to a little bit of the uh, disagreement between uh, you two about how much the media matters, that maybe the, uh, the media doesn't, uh, can't tell us what to think, but it can tell us what to think about. Um, and does that at least sort of fit with what I you're, said, yeah. I actually think, we, I have a little different view as it. Um, I'm a Packer fan, I'm a shareholder. I have been going to games since the early 60s. But I've been married to this guy who was a Colts fan, and then they left town in the middle of the night, which he's never recovered from, and then the Ravens. I mean, like, who cares about the Ravens? But on a Sunday night after I hear everybody talk about the Ravens, the Ravens, I come home and say, did the Ravens win? Now, why do I care about that? You know, there, there is some level of contagiousness in terms of, you know, when everyone keeps talking about the same topic, then you get interested in it. And so, so to the extent that the media just talks about one thing, it starts, you start to get a little bit of an interest in it, a little bit more than you might otherwise have. It's, it's a little contagious. And so then it goes, you know, our responsibility to make good judgment. We don't make perfect judgments. Like, you know, is that in a limited amount of time or space or whatever, we have to decide, like, you know, how, how do we, uh, you know, what's our individual judgment as to what news that we should present tonight? And, you know, if any of you watch my show, I do some stupid animal thing at the end, and you may think I'm a moron, and why am I wasting my time on that? It's a good question, but I like animals. But I mean, so it's, it's all a judgment. So 
Let me ask one more thing, and then I want to make sure to open it up to, to questions here, so I'll try to make this uh, brief. But uh, why doesn't the market solve this? And I think, so uh, you know, he suggested a little bit there, I think, on technology being being the role. But it, I could also at least imagine ways that goes differently. You know, I mean, I'm old enough to remember when the internet was supposed to be this great democratizing force and would open up people to exposure to all sorts of different ideas. Uh, and so it at least seems plausible to me that you could tell just the opposite story. So, you know, why, if there's a demand for other perspectives here, why isn't that being? Excellent question. I'm an economist. <laughs> Why is that? I've thought lots about it. I, I think the best explanation may come from a quote from Henry Luce, former uh, publisher, owner maybe of Time magazine. And someone asked him, this was like 60s, they said, Henry, you're a Republican. Why do you hire so many Democrats? And, and he said, because the GD Republicans can't write. <laughs> okay. I think what's going on is that Republicans, people who, ha I think there's a Republican gene, people who have the Republican gene aren't as interested in the creative fields, the things that don't have a right and wrong answer. So things like the arts, poetry, that those fields are, are going to be overwhelmingly Democrat. And I think what's going on is uh, journalism, you're, you're writing, and it's a, a creative thing. Meanwhile, engineering or the military are going to be things that Republicans want, want to go to. Republicans, the kids from, from college just don't go into journalism as much. I, maybe I don't understand the question, right? but I think the people aren't voting. Because, and go back to my example in the beginning, where everyone says, we want to see human trafficking. So I traipse across the country and go human trafficking, click. You know, I, that, I think that, I mean, in some ways, I mean, people are telling us what they want. You know, so I think that's why the market doesn't handle it, because if the market doesn't want that, they want two politics, two politicians screaming at each other, but don't want to hear about the plight of people starving in Cambodia, you know? So I think there's no voting. I mean, I think the voting tells us, they, by, the, by the remotes. Um, I, I'll just say very briefly, um, uh, I think I think most people are too busy to waste their time yeah. with our stuff, and but I think that's, that's a good thing because I think that there's not, I mean, they're living their lives and their lives are hard enough. Um, I will just say there's a great quote from Christopher Lash. Um, he said that, you know, people say that people have disinvested from politics in America or from the media because they're ignorant, but the truth is the opposite. Um, being being a part of a debate is what makes you go and get information. I don't know if you've ever experienced this, but like, you know like when you're fighting with somebody and there's like one piece of information that would like really prove your point and you will literally spend all night searching for it, right? Because you wanna win that argument. And he argues that the reason people are disinvested from media and politics is because they've been cut out of the conversation. It is irrelevant what they think as opposed to that example when you're in the fight and it's so relevant. And you know, I, I kind of think that the, the debate, the fighting, like, the, that's sexy. I mean, that's something that an economist can't tell you. But like, there's something sexy about that debate and bringing people into it and talking about stuff that they get exercised about. Um, it's just about finding the topics that I think are relevant to their lives. Okay. Thank you. So let's open it up to uh, questions. Where are we heading then? I mean, how does this play out? You know, are we going to crash and burn or, or cycle back? I mean, what, what, what's going to happen? Well, if you want the real doomsday, it's artificial intelligence. I mean, I did a, you know, I mean, I, I did a story that I did just to show artificial intelligence. I plugged in, uh, do a story on craft beer, and did a beautiful story on craft beer. They didn't need me. I mean, if you really want to know what the doomsday is. If I can say something, there's some studies that show this uh, uh, chat GPT, some of this yeah. artificial intelligence, has a leftward bias. I, th I think that could be fixed if the, the creators of that would just ha have those programs read all the congressional speeches. That was the key point of my book. Look, there's a, you know, a balance of views. Um, to answer your question, the key point of my book is that we're kind of in an equilibrium. I, I said, you know, it, the, the media has shifted the views to the left of where voters' natural views are. 
but they can't keep doing it. So we're at my, my general model would be that we're the best prediction of what's gonna happen is it's gonna be like it is today. Um, uh, Democrats hate losing elections. So after they lose elections, they, they sort of right the boat a little bit. So you saw that um, um, after Glenn Youngkin won, there was like this huge, I mean, the New York Times really did shift a little bit further to the center after that. So it, it, I, I agree, there is a kind of sense. I can't, it's not gonna get much worse uh, before it gets there. This is really fascinating stuff that you guys have uh, talked about tonight. Thank you for being here. I have two questions, and they're kind of divergent. Um, one, can you expound on the overwhelmingly East Coast-centric nature of the news coverage by the national media? It seems like anything that happens west of Philadelphia, oh. just it's like it, it doesn't happen unless it's either a catastrophic natural disaster or a really horrific crime. My second question is, I remember when I was in J school a long time ago, we were taught you play issues down the center, you give both sides of the story. Has academia shifted in how it teaches young journalists to tell them that they should have more of an advocacy role? Has that really foundational element of old, old school journalism changed or is it just, what you've talked about is just being, just that the more they want to be part of the club and that drives how they act in the professional role. Thanks. So I'll just answer the second one really quickly and then pass it to you guys about the very difficult first one, which is like, you're so totally right. Um, so the state schools and the schools that are in places like Wisconsin, places where you have a more mixed cli you know, cl clientele, a working class students, they're getting the down the middle of the road stuff. If you go to Columbia Journalism School, you're getting the whole like, quoting a Republican is an act of bigotry, like you need to take a moral stand, we're about moral clarity now. So that it's, yeah, the more elite the school is, the more you're getting that point of view. Let me give you some old information on the, the second part. I, you know, look, you know, take it with a grain of salt, but um, years ago, I haven't paid much attention to this, that there are more TVs turned on on the East Coast than there is in Central, or in the mountains, there aren't any TVs. So when you program something and what you put on, you put on where all the TV sets are, where all the people are. So you're naturally going to do that unless something catastrophic happens in Los Angeles or San Francisco. Um, plus, you know, the, a lot of the stuff is driven out of the East Coast in prime time. Well, by the time it's prime time in California, you're asleep. You know, so it's, a, so it's just sort of a, a natural thing, and people tend to report about things that they know about, and all everybody, the, the media centers, the media center, I'm in Washington, but the, uh, for, uh, but the media centers, you know, in, in New York. That's where all the big studios are. So that's just my, my thought on it. Um, it's not science, they, they do the study stuff. I just do things off the top of my head. <laughs> Uh, just a casual observation. Uh, I, I think the, the media used to claim, even the New York Times, no, no, we're centrists, we're centrists. Uh, I think with Trump, it, it changed. I think a lot of them would say, no, we're not fair and balanced with Trump, and we shouldn't be. They, they kind of started admitting it. Um, it, it who knows if, if that's going to continue once another Republican becomes president. Let me just okay. add a distinction. When we talk about foreign news, that's a little different. That's 24-7. I mean, with all that's going on in, um, in Eastern and Western Europe, I think, so that, that is not East Coast-centric. I mean, that's obviously, and, out, and, and everybody's concerned about that because kids, or young men and women from this part of the country go off and fight wars in other parts of the country, but when you're just talking about domestic news, is my thought on that. Okay, um, just uh, I'm thinking of two things. One is um, I came to U.S. about 1990s. It's a new term at the time. I heard there's a market segmentation, which means niche markets, I guess. Uh, so previously it looks like the mass market, then it's changing into niche markets. I wonder how that um, the segmentation, the niche markets spreading around, have to do with the media. Um, market, that's what I'm thinking. The second thing is fact opinion thing. 
I, I, I think I read somebody say this, when you have one reporter there have a camera, you get you know, the facts over there. But when you have 10, 100 people, everybody has a cell phone spreading around. Um, the line between opinion and fact becoming increasingly blurred, difficult to decide, and that really worries me, honestly. <laughs> like, uh, but the other thing is uh, the market segmentation. I wonder what if, in fact, uh, it has. Uh, um, so I'll answer the first, and then maybe Greta, you take the second one. About the, the, about the cameras? Yeah, about uh, citizen journalism and opinion versus fact. Um, so, the, so digital media basically accelerated that, right? They took a mass product, mass media product, and then turned it into basically niche different niches, uh, but it turned out that all the legacy media wanted the same niche, which was that 6% of affluent white progressives, right? Um, so there's a lot of attention on them, and then the other places are sort of, you know, floundering, but that, that was sort of because of the way digital media works. Engagement gets you those ad dollars, right? Engagement, you can sell data, you can mine data. While every article somebody's clicking on the New York Times, you can then take that data, mine that data, and then use it for either to sell or for, for ads. So it, it really just accelerates exactly what you're describing. Um, now, um, news consumption. First of all, uh, except for watching my show, which you should never touch a remote for, um, you know, it's good, it's good to shop news, which brings me to the answer to your questions. I actually like the citizen journalists is because I, the, I think the camera, I think, I think it's better to just see things. And so I actually like more rather than less because then you can sort of fact check us. If we say the house is burning down, you go, hey, out of your mind, there's nothing burning there. Um, you know, so I actually, I like citizen journalists. I like a lot of the cameras. I like a lot of the opportunities. I think you should shop all day long, except during my show. Just shop it all and look at all the video. If I can, I want to give one anecdote about how a, a photo can be biased. This happened uh, a long time ago. Stanford and USC are playing a football game. It becomes halftime, it turns out the bands hate each other. The Stanford band especially hates the USC band, they think they're too militaristic. So what the Stanford band did while they're playing, they had dollar bills in their pockets and they threw them down on the field, all over the field. So the USC band comes out and they say, everyone wants to see, are they gonna? Oh, and they also said that USC is University of Spoiled Children, they're all money hungry. They wanted to see if the USC band would reach down to grab the dollar bills. Well, they didn't, they played, okay. Second half starts, but there's all these dollar bills on the field. What happens? One of the USC players who's gonna retrieve the kickoff gets a whole big bundle of these dollar bills and hands it to the referee. At that moment, an AP reporter <laughs> took a photo. <laughs> The key is, if you don't have the context, sometimes it won't give you the accurate story, even with the photo. Hello? Oh, sorry, a little loud. Um, so I guess I was gonna ask you guys, do you think that a lot of the things that you guys are talking about is a symptom of neoliberalization of the United States economy and the growing wealth inequality within the United States? Like, for example, you guys are talking about how journalists like now come from these elite university institutions and they're not coming from the working class anymore. But maybe one of the reasons why we're not seeing as many working class journalists is because now it's harder to go out and do journalism because you have less money and you have to work more hours to become a journalist. So to, to what extent is it, and sorry, that the fluctuation in the noise, I'm not good with mics. <laughs> um, to what extent do you guys think that wealth inequality is a factor within these within this, uh, these problems that you guys are stating and like things like the Build Back Better bill, which was gonna address some of the issues with trying to get into college and stuff like that, like making community college free and free childcare would address these issues. Thank you. Um, well, <laughs> yeah, I think, I think, well, I don't, but I, I think that's true, yeah. They're, 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 the inequality, it looks like it is growing. Um, all I would say, I, I don't do macroeconomics, but I, I think it, it, it is possible. Some, it's just it's, there's some natural, uh, you know, non-government aspects that causes inequality to go up or down. For instance, it was near its lowest, uh, like late '60s or something. Now it's been growing. Um, we never know what's going to be the next invention that could cause it. To, to become less, and, and I hope it does. I, I grew up in Hot Springs, Arkansas. When I go back to visit Arkansas, 
it, it, it saddens me the inequality between r rural and cities. And the last time I was in, well, two times ago I was in Arkansas, uh, I, I just looked at every, it seemed like every single building I saw had been built before 1995. And it uh, just saddened me. I think though COVID has actually caused rural and, and less dense areas to, to grow a little bit. We'll see if, if that really That's happened. Okay. But in, in some I, ways, I would say there was a, a silver lining of, of COVID. You came up to me at the separate time, but you came up to me in the reception and you asked about local TV and I told you I'd talk to you. Just let me jump to local TV. I spent recently in the past couple of years local TV, which we're talking about sort of a national digital. And I got to tip my hat to local TV because at, whenever I, I, my, my careers have been you know, parachuted into some place and report on some horrible shooting or something. And I'd go back to the hotel room and I'd turn on the TV and watch the local. The quality of the local TV, so good because they can put so much context and they can even say, you know, what streets are there that I don't even know about coming in temporarily. And local TV is actually, uh, it, it is, uh, the local TV, I see, it may not be as polished sometimes, but boy, when you talk about content and putting things in content and uh, in, in context, local TV does a spectacular job, I think. Yeah, I also wanted to say about you, I um, was reading in your book about uh, what things were like in the 1920s and in the decades before that, which was maybe the one past time uh, that we've had this sort of similar levels of, of inequality. Um, so, you know, to the extent that it's driven by inequality, it seems uh, like some of the question is, did we see the same thing when we were in this place before. I mean, we're definitely living through another Gilded Age. We haven't had this level of inequality since the, you know, that, that time, and that's when, but, that, but then it was met, that inequality was met with this wild, you know, populist journalism of the people for the people. I totally agree with you, I think you're spot on, but I would say it's not just journalists. Um, it's, so, so new data came out that shows that nine of the 10 richest counties in America, nine out of every 10 of the richest um, counties in America went for Democrats. And we know that 98% of Silicon Valley gazillionaires gave all you know polit political donations to Democrats. Wall Street gave more money to Joe Biden than Donald Trump. So we're seeing a wider political realignment to where the Democrats, which used to be the party of the working class, has become the party of affluent, you know, over-credentialed elites. And the Republicans now, ha their voter base is the working class, essentially increasingly multiracial, multiethnic. So that, so it's, I think the journalists rode that wave um, of inequality to where it's the left, ironically, that has been benefiting from inequality, while the right is much more downwardly mobile. So I, I think you're spot on. So um, I, I just I just wanted to thank you all for um, being here and uh, sharing your thoughts today. Uh, I my question is kind of multifaceted, uh, so forgive me if this kind of expands uh, upon this. But um, my my main concern is that when you look at the media today, uh, you actually see that. 90% of all media is owned by six companies uh, in total. And my main concern with that is that, you know, I, I think it does hearken to some of what you're saying as far as that you aren't getting a diverse uh, approach to, to what, you know, like a, a, um, a broader, uh, I guess, sensibility towards um, what is actually out there as far as uh, ideas. Um, my like second part of this uh, question though is, um, when you say left, I'm, I'm a little bit confused because in America we don't really have like a labor party or um, like a working party like in, in Europe. So my concern with that is that like when we use terms like Democrat and left interchangeably, it's not actually telling the full story as far as the dynamics that um, our political climate could actually have and has grown uh, since uh, Bernie has taken the stage. Right. So uh, my question for you then is with, um, with this growing change, um, how do you see that being expanded upon when Fox News is like one of the largest and most watched uh, networks um, 
how, how do we expand like our overall discussions to include um, not just Democrat and Republican, but also all so viewpoints. I, let me let me just take that if I could start. First of all, Fox News, which I'm going to spend a number of years, I know their numbers. When you say they're the most watched, that's true of the cable audience. They're watched by three or four million people. There are 350 million people in this country. So it's like, you know, that's what you see. If, if it, it, We used to be, when I was there, they had to keep moving the Fox bug around on the screen because it was burning through people's screen. People tend to turn on cable news and sit there. And so they only watch things. You know, they watch things. I, I don't agree with the premise that there aren't a lot of sources. Sure, these six companies or whatever number owned it, but there are thousands on Twitter. I get a lot of my news even on Twitter. I'll do hashtag Sudan, and I'll get all these things I even get from people in Sudan. I think it's a matter of shopping and being an aggressive news shopper. So I think there really are a lot of outlets. It's just this, this oversized thing about cable news where we talk about even like Fox being the most watched. Three or four million just doesn't, you know, millions are watching, are doing something else. So I, I just sort of disagree with the premise on because people just sit on, I mean, three million will sit on Fox, you know, 500,000 will sit on CN or, or whatever, so people sit when, you know, when they should be shopping a little more. Yeah, I must say, my book, I, there's a chapter where I, I try to estimate where people are getting their news, and, and Fox is a tiny fraction, that, um, I think less than 5%. Um, um, let's see, the, the other, the, I've heard that um, fact, or that, statistic that, uh, that only six companies own all the media outlets. When I was doing my research for this, it would take something like a month and a half to get all the data for each outlet. And so I had done something like eight outlets and someone said, well, oh, what about this outlet? And I said, oh, please, I don't want it. It got up to 20. And, every, and even after I did 20, people said, oh, why don't you do this outlet? It, and so when people say there's so few outlets, I say, oh, didn't seem that way when I was uh, collecting all my data. Now, it is true of those 20 outlets, some of them were owned by the, 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 the same owner. And I actually did some, uh, some statistical tests to see if they were different. I think like at the time, CNN and Time were both owned by AOL Time Warner. So for instance, I looked. I tested whether the slant of those two different outlets were different, and I, I could reject the null that they're the same. I, I found that they were different. And then even within outlets, just my casual Wait. observation, they allow reporters Wait. to be different. Yeah, I mean, the, nobody's, I mean, at least no one's ever told me what to say or do, which may be part of my problem. I don't take orders too well. Um, but if you take, let's just take local TV where I've been for a while. It's just an example. And under local TV FCC rules, they can only penetrate, they can only have enough stations to penetrate 39% of the country, so they're capped. But you take a, take a, a station group like Gray, where I work, they had, I think, 124 stations all over the country. Well, there's no way that the CEO of Gray was telling all these different stations in different time zones, different sizes, with different problems. He's like, it, it, there really is a tremendous amount of news out there. The problem is, is that it, the, the discussion about cable can be outsized. And so you get this impression that there aren't thousands of other, you know, places and that's just in, in local TV. And I didn't talk about Nexstar or Sinclair or any of the other Hearst. I mean there are thousands I mean you have no idea how much is out there. And it, it would you know, I want you to watch just my show, don't get me wrong. Okay? But but I will tell you this is that if if we can encourage people to think fact versus opinion, that'd be great. And also to be aggressive news consumers because you know you you, you and, and you, that's what I would just recommend. Except well, for at five o'clock central. Well, one final thing, I, I, I'm fine. I, I, I prefer a diversity of uh, news outlets. In fact, if you ask me, if I don't agree with the communists nor the Nazis, but if you ask me, should they have a network? I'd say, yeah, I'd be for both of them. Have it. That, I, I think that would be fine. So it looks like we have time for just one more question. So, Sure. How is morale in the journalism profession these Two days? Uh, there, uh, there's, yeah, because there's been a collapse both in trust and an increase in outright derision, you know I think, among a large uh, segment of the population of major, uh, major news outlets. So for the average journalist, uh, you know, do they feel a collapse in morale, or are they so high in their own supply that they're um, beyond introspection about the uh, spade think, of their profession? I think you'll find a little bit of both, but morale to me is tied to integrity. And I don't care which news organization you work at, 
if you've kept your integrity and you're doing your best job, I don't care what's going on around you, and integrity is like one of those weird things is that like no one can take it from you, you can only abandon it, and if you are proud of your work, morale is going to be strong. You don't like, I mean, look, I don't like when I work at news organizations they're getting slapped around a little bit. But as long as, I, as long as I look at, you know, and doing my work, and I think that's true of all journalists. I mean, but you know, I, morale might be a little bit low because there there are layoffs. You know, you're going to see a lot of morale layoffs. But it's an exciting job. I mean, where do you get a ringside seat to everything that's going on in the world? I mean, it is a very exciting work. So if morale, it's it's probably a little bit, I think, in within. But you guys may disagree. As the economist, I want to, my first thought is, well, who cares about morale? What, the important thing is salaries. What, what about salaries? Thank you. And the, and the TV business, don't, the TV business, I mean, it's print, print takes a big hit on salaries. They, they get paid less than TV. So, you know, and, and you can see like BuzzFeed today, so I think I read something today, BuzzFeed's closing up. I don't know if any of you follow BuzzFeed. Um, but that's done. But you know, generally in TV, it, they do okay. Some of the, the uh, local TVs don't pay as well as the national, and so they're doing well. But if you're talking about pay linked to morale, yeah, it's low. If you're talking about uh, morale linked to excitement of the job, that's really within you. Right. So I feel like this is what I'm telling my kids. They have just one more chance. But it looks like we have time for one more question. Thank you. I really wanted to applaud you on making, you all made several points. Uh, and. I, I was had a dozen questions come, but I guess being a locally elected political leader, uh, and all politics is local according to Tip O'Neill, one of the challenges we have is because of the narratives that come from both the West Coast and the East Coast, the West Coast is our entertainment capital, East Coast is the news capital, but most of the work we have to do, which is very mundane to maintain a great community, uh, the influence that comes from the coasts interrupts the ability of people here to understand what's really going on, because it very rarely gets covered. And Greta brought up a great thing you were talking about, and being from Wisconsin, you probably know this, but our economy is entirely different than the rest of the country. We've never given up manufacturing in this state. We have a huge, what is now really a transitional, the old-fashioned blue collar, and it's actually gonna get enhanced because of AI. Our technical colleges and some of our universities are taking that on, and it's about education being reformed, which will have nothing to do with the prejudice of the media or what we thought of as past prejudices. And that's really what I'm wondering when you look at that, you know, and especially, it's gonna be driven economically. And Greta, you talked about the fact that uh, a lot of journalism is based on the economics at the large networks, but I think that's gonna be continually uh, gone after because what you just brought up, the local media, uh, people having cameras, if people start uh, getting more excited about what's actually going on in their neighborhood, in their community, and realizing, like for Waukesha County, it's not as dull and not as uh, negative as it is in other parts of the country. Well, if you take something like school cho schools, is I will tell you is that if you talk at a national media reporting about a school issue in, um, in Eau Claire, or you get a local reporter talking about a school issue in Eau Claire, you're gonna get very, probably a different quality report as much as I'm national appreciate because the local local reporter in Eau Claire probably has a kid in the schools or probably has a neighbors in school and it just brings a whole other dynamic when you when you when you when you feel when you're part of the story. And so you know I, I'm just a big fan of besides you know obviously I've always I gotta say how much I like national news, but the local local reporting and I assume this is true of print, oftentimes you know, because they live there, they have more vested in, in it, you know, than, than sometimes people parachuting in. Um, I guess I would, if the question is, is like, how can you overcome the pressures, like in your work, what can, you know, what can individuals here do to uh, fight those strong headwinds that would make, you know, bipartisan cooperation less appealing because they'd rather have a hit on Fox News than, you know, have a handshake deal with a Democrat. My answer to that, I think, is, you know, um, you have to make it personal and precious. So it, the, my answer to that is always to tell people to go to church or to go volunteer, to, to, to find and protect spaces in their lives where they encounter people they disagree with so that the person, when they're thinking about, should I make this handshake deal that will help people or should I chase the hit or the tweet, they have somebody that they feel answerable to who has a face and who they love and who, that there's a cost to betraying that 
here in their community. I don't think, I think local news is dead. I agree with you, it's incredible and really important, but I think it's just not financially feasible anymore. And, and those headwinds are the really powerful. that's the shoppers, that's the shoppers. You know, it's, it's because, you know, it is, but it's, it's, a, I mean, it's, a, but it's yeah. a reality. And so I would say that the work has to be done on an interpersonal communal level, but that, that really actually empowers every single one of us to be part of the, the people stitching back together the fabric of the society instead of tearing it apart, which I'm sure you're doing, so. <laughs> Thank you. Um, do any of you have any closing, uh, brief closing comments before we end? Thank this? you. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Well, I thank you guys so thank much. All thank all you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. All right. By, by their books, uh, watch Get Up, 5 p.m. Central so, every day. All right. And thank you all for coming. This has been a wonderful evening. <laughs>